Welcome to this Maths Methods 3 and 4 revision for Chapter 17, which is specifically continuous random variables and their probability distributions. Now, I think I need to say straight up that the examples I'm going to use are straight from the Cambridge Essential Mathematics Methods 3 and 4 CAS textbook. No intention has been made to infringe copyright, and my apologies if it has. However, it is simply a video resource for my current students to assist in their preparations for their VCE examination. Hopefully, you'll uh, give me your understanding. Okay, so what is a continuous random variable and their probability distributions? This is going to come over as a bit of a sort of hodgepodge of the video because uh, it's trying to get a lot of information into one particular idea. Um, so, if we look at uh, discrete random variables, we worked out that they were things that could take whole number values. It could be, for example, a number of eggs in a basket. A continuous random variable, for example, would be, I think a good example is always weight. All right? You could argue that my weight at this moment in time is 47 kilos. Uh, I wish it was 47 kilos. However, it's, that's me rounding it to a specific whole value. If I got onto slightly more accurate scales, I could probably be 47.2 kilos. Or even more accurate, 47.236 kilos. Or if I was on some sort of atomic scale somewhere, I could have my weight measured to all sorts of different, you know, decimal places. So finding the probability that uh, I will be a specific weight, and we are coming back to the idea that this is probability, um, is actually impossible because my weight can't theoretically be measured to any degree of accuracy. Yeah, we can look at ideas of, you know, what it is to the nearest whole number, but the concept of being able to find the probability that I am a specific weight is not necessarily easy uh, or, in fact, possible. Now, one of the great things we do is we use a lot in mathematics is the idea of a bell curve. And here's one I drew earlier. We're all familiar with the bell curve because VCE tends to use it for their grading and their ATAR scores, and uh, I know personally find that a little bit strange. But we know the general idea of this bell curve is that uh, if we look at it in terms of probabilities, this value on the top here is our most popular probability, something that's going to happen the most number of times. And remember that, the most number of times. Obviously things down on this end here and this end here probably are not as likely to happen. And for example, if we were to do, look at the scores on die, if we would throw two die together, we'd very much end up with probabilities looking like this. Now, the wonderful things about probabilities is we know that if we were looking at all the outcomes being along the bottom of our graph, with this here being, I don't know, the least likely, or this one here also being the least likely, and the one up here being the most likely, then what we find is, hopefully, all of our probabilities will add to make one. That is basically, if I was to take all of these individual values going up the curve and add them individually, they'd all come to one. Now, a lot of the theories in the textbook about, you know, why and how and what we can go forward. One of the great things we know about a probability distribution function, otherwise known as a PDF, is that the area under that graph is equal to one. So the area is equal to one. Well, that's pretty cool because if I have some sort of a function, f of x, for example, then what I can now say is so long as I know that the values of the function of x are all greater than or equal to zero, i.e. there is none in this negative part of the graph, and that we can define some limit between the start and the end of our graph, and maybe more on that a little bit later on, then this thing is a probability distribution function, and we can work out that all of our probabilities add up to one, or the area under that graph is equal to one, or more specifically, we can find out that the integral of f of x dx is equal to one. Now, I'm gonna put limits of a and c on here because the limits are important as to where the graph starts and where the graph finishes. But we'll come up to that in, in a little bit more time. So, the basic idea for this whole section is that the integral of the function of x with respect to x is equal to 1 if it's a probability distribution function and, more importantly, 
that this f of x is greater than or equal to zero. One of the other things I want to do uh, for a moment is just go back to our blank PDF uh, or probability distribution function and just look at a couple of uh, additional information. What we said a moment ago, or what I said a moment ago, was that this value here, this top value here, this very, very top of our graph, actually is quite important. Because what it means is it's the most common probability, it's the most common outcome. It's the outcome we are statistically, or with probability, going to have occur the most times. So as I keep saying the word most, it would suggest to me that this top value here, the very, very top of my probability density function, is equal to the most frequent, the most common, the most expected value. Well, we know that the top of this PDF is actually a straight line. Right? If I was to draw a tangent to the PDF, what would I end up? I'd end up with a straight line. And what would the gradient of that straight line be? Well, the gradient would equal to zero. So that's quite interesting as well, because what we now come back to, and a little bit more on this later, is the mode, right, or the most expected value would be found by differentiating our PDF. So you differentiate your PDF, or your function more specifically, you differentiate your function, and whatever value you get, you put equal to zero, or whatever uh, equation you get, you put equal to zero, and that will help you find this value here, this most common value of x. That seems pretty awesome. Now again, this diagram is a little bit misleading because it's quite a symmetrical graph. But again, if I was to draw a line smack down the middle of this graph at the moment, well, what would I know? If it's in the middle, I would know that values here, right, or a values in this side would actually take up 50% of my PDF. And hopefully, values on this side would also be 50%. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, it means we can use the idea of 50% because we know that the median of a PDF is where we find 50% of our data. So if we could find a position, if I know that half of my probabilities lie here, then I should be able to use that information to help me find my median. Right, so I now know mode and I know median, and we'll come back to the idea of finding means in a moment, because this graph actually is quite symmetrical, but not all cases will we end up in that situation. We've got some basic theory now. Let's look at some very quick examples. Now, I have nothing fancy at this moment in time with regards to whiteboards with questions on it. just want to try and make this as quick as possible. So imagine we have a function of x, the density function, c of x, for values between 0, x, and 2, and that it is 0 for all other times, where x is greater than 2 or x is less than 0. Now, that's quite important, because what that is saying is that other for my function, f of x, is equal to zero for all other parts of my function, but for some aspect, I know that f of x is greater than or equal to zero. So that means it's a great idea. There is a chance it is a PDF, but we also know that for it to be a probability distribution function, we know that the integral of f of x dx has to be equal to one. Now, generally, that's between minus infinity and infinity. But we have limits here. We have been told that this function is only true between 0 and 2 inclusive. Well, that means now that I can use that information to say, well, to find the value of c that will make this a PDF, I do the integral of c of x dx. I know my limits are between 0 and 2. And there we go. I put that in square brackets. I get c x squared over 2 between the values of 2 and 0. Substitute that in, what do I get? I get c times 4 over 2 minus 0, because that's all going to equate to 0, or 2c. Well, that's the integral of the function, was equal to 2c. And I now know that for this to be a PDF, the integral of that has to also equal 1. So I know that 2c has got to be equal to 1, or c becomes equal to a half. 
There you go. So I now know for this to be a probability density function, it's got to basically be a half x there. Well, how is this useful to me? Well, what if I wanted to find the probability that the value of x is greater than 1.5? Well, I know that my function is defined, and I think this is one of the interesting, if not confusing, bits. We've actually been told which values our function is divided by between 0 and 2. So if I want to find the probability of my x value being greater than 1.5, if we look at my very quick sketch of my probability density function, I know that my lowest value is between 0, and I know my highest value is between 2. And it's effectively saying, well, there's 1.5. What percentage of my graph is given in that shaded area? How do we find that? Well, we use our newly acquired probability distribution function, um, and we just integrate between different values. Now, I don't think I've got a huge amount of room left on this, so excuse me, but let's have a go. I'm now trying to find the integral of a half of x dx between my lower bound of 1.5 and my upper bound of 2. If I integrate that, what do I get? I get x squared over 4 between the values of 2 and 1.5, and that gives me 0 0.4375. So I now know that 43.75% of my population of that graph fits in this section here, 43.75%. Generally, however, we give things in terms of four decimal places. Looking at the textbook, I'm probably going to skip the section on cumulative distribution functions, which is 17.2, as it's really not in the Maths Methods 3 and 4 CAS study design and they're only covering it because it's useful to just have a consideration. What we're going to do now is move on to the ideas of mean, median, and mode for a continuous random variable. We already looked a moment ago at our continuous uh, probability density function, and we noticed it looked very much like a bell curve. And what we said was, well, we can find various items because we know that now the mode is going to be the value on here, and the median is going to be the value which allows 50% of my population to be on this side, and similarly, 50% to be on this side. But what about the mean? Because normally when we teach maths all the way down in year 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, we'll probably remember the four letters M, 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 R, which otherwise stands for mean, median, mode, and range. Well, in a previous exercise, we looked at the idea of how to find the mean, or the expected value, using... Uh, discrete random variables. The same type of concept works here. I'm just going to write down the formula because you should realistically be able to know this if this is a revision. And we're told that the expected value of x, the mean of a continuous random variable, is given by the integral between minus infinity and infinity of x multiplied by f of x dx. Now, there are lots of other formulas in there as well, particularly this one, which I have to admit, when you watch it the first time, looks a little bit strange. But again, it goes between minus infinity and infinity of g of x multiplied by f of x dx. Now, when you first look at this, it's like, well, what on earth does that mean? Or well, maybe an example below sort of gives you uh, some idea. Here we go. I want to find the expectation of x squared. What it's actually saying is, you notice the g of x is here inside this bracket? You notice that g of x there? It's just saying whatever's inside this bracket, write it in front of the integral. So I'm going to have my limits of minus infinity to infinity. I'm going to write x squared there, f of x, dx. And lo and behold, that's how I find my expected value of that function. What if I wanted, if I had this function, was given by 0.5x between x is 0 and 2, and it's 0 at all other places. Right, so I want to find the expected value of x squared. Um, all right, so we know it's got something to do with the integral. Look, it's pretty much a, a, a regurgitation of this. Do I need the minus infinity and infinity? No because I know my function is actually valid between 0 and 2. They're the limits. 
It doesn't exist anywhere outside of those two values. And what did I have to do? Well, whatever's written in here, I just copy in front of my f of x, right? Because it's the g of x times by my original function. Well, this is my g of x, the x squared becomes x squared, and f of x is literally 0.5x and the exit. Hmm, interesting. So that becomes the integral between 0 and 2 of 0.5x cubed dx, which becomes the integral, or rather the solution, of x to the 4 over 8 between 2 and 0. And just for speed, really, than anything else, that value, when you work it out, simply becomes 2. So I know the expected value of x squared is 2, right? So again, just sort of boiling this down to basics, whatever is inside this bracket, just write it here. Notice the changing case. That was a capital X, and we write it as small x here. Well, we've already thought about the median, all right? Earlier, we, we looked at our bell curve that suggested that half of our values were going to be in the bottom half of the graph, and half of our values were going to be in the top half of our graph. But how does that help us? We know that the bell curve splits things up into percentiles, right, or percentages. We knew previously that the integral of f of x dx is equal to 1 between some sort of value of a and b. Well, if I want to find the median, and I know the whole area, the differential of this function is equal to 1 for the whole area, then I'm pretty sure that it shouldn't be a huge leap to say that the function of x dx equal to 0 0.5 would give me the values of a and b whereby 50% of my data lies. And that's pretty much how you find the median. You're looking for a value that is equal to 50%. Um, quick example, I think so. Imagine we have the probability density function. All right, so, and what does that actually want us to find? Well, let's say we want to find the median value. Right, so the median. Well, we've decided the median is where it's equal to 0.5. So what we'd effectively be trying to find out. So what function do I need to write? Um, well, I know it's going to be the integral of 2, 1 minus x dx. I know that's got to be equal to 0.5. The interesting thing is, while I know where this graph starts, and it starts at 0, how do I know it starts at 0? Because it tells me here, and I know the upper bound is 1, I don't actually know where this value is here to put half of the data. On a standard bell curve, it would be 0.5, obviously, because, you know, it's symmetrical, but it doesn't look like this will be symmetrical about a particular point. So, what do I do? Um, well, let's, we don't know what that value is, so let's say, well, we're going to find, we know that 50% falls in this part of my graph here. I know that it starts at zero, but I don't know what this value is here. So I'm actually going to integrate it between zero and m to see what actually happens. Well, when I integrate that between zero and m, what do I get? Well, I get in brackets 2x minus x squared between the values of m and zero equal to 0 0.5. And when you substitute that, then obviously, you know, putting zero onto there, that's all going to disappear into zero. Um, putting m into there gives me 2m minus m squared equals 0 0.5. Mm, okay, that looks like it's a quadratic to me, so I can rearrange that to m squared minus 2m plus 0 0.5. And for speed and brevity, then we could use our CAS calculator to solve that. And what do we find? Well, we get our values of m work out to be 0 0.293 and 1.707. We get two values. Well, of course we're going to get two values because we have had a quadratic. Well, which one of these values? Do they both make sense? Well, no, of course not. We know this value of m has got to lie between the limits of my function. And bearing in mind my function only goes between 0 and 1, then this value of 1.707 cannot make any sense at all. And so we find that 0 0.293 is the value of where my median would lie. Right? So 0 0.293 is the value of my median. Let's move on to the mode very quickly. 
we've talked about the mode being on our PDF, our bell curve, the highest value. We know the highest value is where the gradient is equal to zero, and wherever you see a maximum or a minimum, you're pretty much being told to differentiate. Let's look at a quick example. I've got the function is defined by 12x squared in brackets 1 minus x between 0 and 1, and I have it 0 at all other times. Right, and it's always important to make sure you look at this. What am I trying to find now? Mm, I'm trying to find the mode. All right, so the mode is the most common, or in this situation, it's where the maximum of my graph appears. Well, if I want to find a maximum of a function, well, I know my function now is 12x squared, 1 minus x. What do I do? Well, I differentiate it. So f dashed of x becomes equal to, and I'm going to multiply it out first, it gives me 12x squared minus 12x cubed. And then when you differentiate that, I get 24x minus 36x squared. Right, okay, that seems to make sense. Right, so I've differentiated it, and if I want to find a maximum, what do I do? Yep, I put it equal to zero. So I put that equal to zero. Factorize out a value of x, I get 24 minus 36x squared equals zero. So I've got x equals zero as one of my factors. And 24 minus 36x squared is equal to zero. And if we look at that, we get the next value of two thirds. So I've got two values for that function. Well, if I was to draw a quick sketch of that and look at it, hopefully it would look something like a bell curve. Well, that we would imagine that x equals zero would be a minimum. Uh, we're not actually going to be that interested in the value of x equals zero. And what we do find is that x equals two thirds is our maximum. So I can now say, therefore, my mode, right, my most common value is actually two thirds. Seems pretty easy. I thought so too. Looking at data is all well and good. However, we sometimes need to be able to compare it to other pieces of data, or in fact, just for our own benefit, know what it looks like. That's where we come into the ideas of variance and standard deviation. Right? Now, variance is denoted by just the words VAR. So if you want to find the variance of X, you do VAR. Right? Standard deviation, because we like all sorts of complicated symbols, is given by that sigma. Right? So the standard deviation is given to the sigma. And these two things are actually related, and I'll come back into a second and ask what they are. But we know that the standard deviation is equal to the root of the variance of x. That's quite useful to know. And what do we need to know? Well, the variance of x is given by the expectation of x squared minus mu squared, right? And what is mu? Mu is the mean. So mu is given by the mean, or as we've seen previously, e of x. Right? So there are a number of interesting pieces of information here that we need to know. But just to give an example, if I look at these two graphs here, really badly drawn, but hopefully given the general idea, what we can sort of see is, and it was my intention to give those exactly the same mean, all right? They were supposed to have exactly the same mean, just bear with me. But what we do find out is actually this graph here is a lot, lot wider, all right? So the chances are this would have a much bigger standard deviation, uh, which is effectively from you know, year 10 maths, a measure of spread. And likewise, you know, the variance would be different. So how can we use our information that we've got for probability density functions to help us find things like variance and standard deviation? Um, well, let's look at an example. Let's have a probability function, density function, nice and easy, given by 0.5x between 0 and 2, and 0 for all other values. That's good. We like that, remember? And what we want to do is try and find out the variance and standard deviation. Right, so we want to find the variance and the standard deviation. Hmm. Let me find the variance. Well, let's go back to our previous slide. We know that standard deviation is equal to the root of the variance of x, 
and the variance of x is given by this thing here. All right, okay, so let's see how we can work that out. So we know variance of x is given by e x squared minus mu squared. Right, all right, so let's see, what's mu squared? Well, we know mu is equal to expectation of x, and we know that's given by finding the integral of x, d of x, between the limits that were given, be it minus infinity or infinity, but in this case, it's between zero and two. All right, well, let's do that first. So we need to work out the integral between two and zero of x times by 0.5x dx, which is going to give us, mm, right, so 0.5x squared, you're going to be with 0.5x cubed over 3 between the limits of 2 and 0. All right, so what happens when we put that in? Putting that in gives me uh, 0.5 times 2 cubed over 3 minus, well, that's going to be 0 because put 0 in there, it's going to be 0. So that's going to give me uh, 0.5, 2 cubed is 8, half of 8 is 4, so that just gives me 4 over 3. So I now know that mu, right, my value of mu, is given by 4 over 3. How do I now find out e of x squared? Well, if you remember, e of x squared is given by the integral between the same limits of 0 and 2 of x squared times the function of x dx. Well, this pretty much all revolves around the one formula. All right, so that's going to give me um, between 0 and 2 of x squared, 0.5x dx. And if we put that into our brackets, that's going to be 0.5x to the 4 divided by 4 between the limits of 2 and 0. And when I stick that into a calculator, I actually come out with a value of 2. Right, okay, well, I'm running out of room here, but important information, I know that my formula there is given by e of x squared. Mm -hmm. And I know what that is, it's 2. I've got to take away mu squared. Well, I now know that mu is 4 over 3. So let's bring up a new sheet just to make it a bit more tidier. And so the variance of x is given by e of x squared minus mu squared. We know that e of x squared is 2. We now know that mu was 4 over 3 squared. So 2 minus 16 over 9 is equal to mm, 2 over 9. So there we go. That's my variance. Awesome! Did I want my variance? No, I needed to know my... Well, yes, I needed to know my variance. But it also wanted me to find my standard deviation. And if you remember, standard deviation is equal to the root of the variance. So we're just going to square root the values of 2 over 9, which gives me root 2 over 3, or 0 0.471 to three decimal places. There we go. I now have a standard deviation and a variance from using pretty much the same information that we've been using before. Remember to make sure that you have your function. Yep. And just make sure you know how to use the expectation and the expectation x squared formula and how to find mu. Moving on to something slightly easier, all right? And I said we'd come back to range. Range is lovely. Range is easy. If I'm told a function of x is equal to, or is defined by 1 over 9, 4x minus x squared, and 0 for all other things, bring 0 x and 3, and obviously not for all other values. Well, nicely, range is easy because it's just asking for what values of x is this defined, and they tell you here, right? They tell you here the biggest value of x is 3, the smallest value is 0. So in this case, the range is just 3. There you go, totally up quick and easy. And uh, what about the interquartile range? Well, from Stats back in years 10 and earlier, we know the interquartile range is given by the 75th percentile minus the 25th percentile. Well, how would I work out where the 25th percentile is? Well, if you remember, if I wanted to find the median or the 50th percentile, what would I do? I would do the integral 
of the function of x dx is equal to 0.5. That would give me my median, or tell me whereabouts my median would be, you know, trying to find what this value is here. Same thing, right? You would just literally put in between 0 and some value m of your function of x dx and paste it equal to 0 0.25 and find your value of m. You would again integrate between 0 and let's call it, I don't know, f between f of x dx uh, is equal to 0 0.75 and find your value of f. And then whatever your value of f was, you take it away m from it, and that gives you your interquartile range. Right? I'm not going to do an example because there's one in the book, but the general theory is it's using percentiles. Right? If you want to find a data, if you want to find a value that actually corresponds to this particular percentile, you just change this value here. If I wanted to find the 60th percentile, if I wanted to find out where 60% of my data lie, I would integrate between 0 and p of my function of x dx and put it equal to 0 0.6 and that will give me where my 60th percentile would lie. The last piece of information for this particular video is just about the ideas that we can use for making life easier for ourselves. We know that the expectation of some function a of x plus b, a linear function, can be rewritten as a expectation of x plus b. Right? You don't have to do all the integral for this, you don't have to do all the hard work. If we can find out the basic expectation of x, and remember the expectation of x is given by the integral of x function of x dx between negative infinity and infinity or whatever limits you've been given, Yes, if I want to find the expectation of 2x plus 3, for example, I'd literally find the expectation of x and just multiply it by 2 and add on a value of 3. Right? That's very much what this equation means. And one other thing is that the variance of a function of ax plus b, and this only works for linear functions, is given by a squared multiplied by the variance of x the b doesn't factor in in any way, shape or form. And, and you know, we could talk about that for hours, but at this moment in time for revision, it's just a case of remembering those two very important pieces of information. Look, this has been a, a quick hop, skip and a jump through this. Um, I may do another video in a moment with some more questions where I can just talk through bits and pieces and we'll just solve a few to give you an example of how it's used. But hopefully this has sort of given you a highlight of continuous random variables and their probability distributions.